Hey, welcome everybody. This is uh, Chris Nagline, and this is Nerd Stravaganza's first VCast. And in celebration of that, we have a very special guest, Ken Height, RPG or tour, and genius, as far as I'm concerned. So um, we're going to start off with just asking Ken how you started in the business. Uh, I started in the business by dint of a couple of different roads. I ran a ton of games when I was going to high school and I was in college. One of the friends that I had who I ran games for eventually got a job at Iron Crown. And because he had a job at Iron Crown, he was sort of on the inside of game design, you know, communication back and forth. I'd run a ton of Call of Cthulhu for him. And Chaosium was coming out at that time with Nephilim. And they sent him a copy, or he got a hold of a copy, of the playtest document for Nephilim. And he thought, well, the guy that really needs to playtest this is my old Black Magic Conspiracy Call of Cthulhu GM, Ken. And he sent it to me, and I sent Chaosium back uh, about 11,000 words of back sass. And I got a uh, response from them that said, how much of this can we use in the core book, and what's the next book you're writing for us? And at the same time as that had happened... Uh, Steve Jackson Games had a very, you know, easily understood, easily followed things we want to see format on their website, which they still have. Actually, this was before websites. They had it in their newsletter. Um, and I had been running a bunch of alternate history games for some friends at the University of Chicago. And three of us got together and wrote up a proposal for what eventually became GURPS Alternate Earths 1. Oh. And at almost the same time that Chaosium was asking me what I wanted to write for Nephilim, Steve Jackson got back to me because I'd gone up to, to Gen Con from Chicago to Milwaukee. It was just a, an hour's ride on the train. And I would go up on the, uh, to Gen Con and I had given him the proposal and talked to him about it. And every Gen Con I'd see him, I'd say, so Steve, what do you think? And he had, it turned out, misfiled it with a different proposal that was terrible. So when he actually got around to reading mine, he said, oh, this is... I was wrong. I want to do this now. So sort of through two different routes, I had two different bites, you know, on this, on different hooks, I guess. And I wrote Secret Societies for Nephilim. And I, uh, the three of us finished out GURPS Alternate Earths for Steve. And so all of a sudden I was doing it. And I, it was uh, sort of, you know, make money to go to Gen Con with Hobby at first. And then as I started writing more and writing more, it became apparent that this could actually be a thing that I did full time. So I quit my job at the insurance company, which was because I just said insurance company, you know how soul deadening it was. Uh, and uh, my wife said, go get a job at the University of Chicago Press. That'll be your backstop. But basically, we're going to do this full time. And sure enough, I'm doing it full time. And it was just a matter of writing things for Steve, writing things for Chaosium, writing things for uh, White Wolf back when they were drinking in uh, freelancers and spitting out I immense numbers of books. And I just did enough of it that it became, it, it got to a point where I was hired full-time by Last Unicorn Games when they got the Star Trek license. I, became, I, I started out designing with them for the, uh, the old uh, icon system for uh, the Star Trek Next Generation role-playing game. They hired me full-time as a designer then, and I pretty much have gone with one uh, open period from company to company being primarily a staff writer, staff designer. So it was Last Unicorn, Decipher, Steve Jackson, and now Pograin. <clears throat> so before we switch subjects, I, I do want to give a, a shout out to your wife because uh, I personally know that in the creative industry, if you have a spouse that can help support you, awesome. Yes. Um, uh, uh, Sheila's health insurance pro, uh, policy is the unsung <laughs> silent partner of, um, uh, of, of my career. So good for her and good for the University of Chicago for offering a generous spousal benefits policy amen yeah so um what do you like better do you like do you like to focus on the rules or the setting i think i'm better at designing settings than i am rules uh i'll tell you designing two star trek games back to back with different rule systems is a great way to get a lot better at designing rules because you have to solve the same problem twice and it's a it's a job of work and so i sort of leveled up at that point as a rules guy but i think my real you know, my real value add, my competitive advantage is setting, is, is taking stuff out of actual history or out of uh, uh, various bits of the imagination, conspiracy mm -hmm. theories, magic, whatever it happens to be, and pulling that into a pre-existing rule set and then 
hooking it in. So you go back to uh, GURPS Cabal that I did for Steve Jackson. That was taking 16th century decanic magic and moving it into the GURPS magic system. And then also building that setting around it, that sort of inverse of the world of darkness where there's a million different supernatural conspiracies. They're all part of the same conspiracy and they hate each other. <laughs> they're hunting little things like humans and they're being hunted by even larger, more cosmic threats. And that uh, was both world creation in, in terms of, of setting building, but it was also rules building because it's taking stuff out of the real world and then trying to translate it through a rule set. And I think, uh, you know, in Gumshoe, for example, if uh, the Ken writes about stuff, we just, I just released Goetia, so that's Goetic Magic from the 17th century in Gumshoe. I've done a two-volume uh, Ken writes about stuff thing on Voodoo. Mm -hmm. So you can interpret Afro-Caribbean magic into the Gumshoe system, plus stuff on mind control, martial arts, whatever it happens to be. So you mentioned really big things in the background, and you mm -hmm. mentioned Gumshoe, which is basically your take of the Cthulhu mythos in an investigative track. Right. So why do you think writers like Lovecraft and that mythology are becoming more enduring compared to like other authors around that time or a little later that are starting to fade? Well, I mean, for one thing, you have to sort of step back a little bit. Uh, the Trail of Cthulhu uh, that I did for uh, Pelgrane based on Robin Laws's gumshoe system, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, it's a licensed Call of Cthulhu adaptation. But I had three masters there. I had to be true to Sandy Peterson's vision for Call of Cthulhu, mm -hmm. and I had to be true to Robin's vision of Gumshoe, and I also had to be true to Lovecraft. And the key is to get back as much as you can to what Lovecraft actually produced, as opposed to the sort of um, uh, nerd uh, barnacles that have clung to the sides of it over time. And it's not that I don't like many of those barnacles. I mean, the game is named Trail of Cthulhu after an August Erleth novel, so I'm recognizing my place in that ecosystem. But Lovecraft's vision is more chaotic and more powerful than I think a lot of people who just come at it through other ancillary material recognize. And so when you talk about someone like Lovecraft, you're talking about someone who really has a cosmic worldview, a, a view of humanity's existence that is formed by the 20th century. And for all that Lovecraft himself was writing in the 19th century, and living as much as he mentally could in the 18th century, his worldview is the 20th century. And so what he's done is he's taken the Gothic and turned it into a modern and into a modernist horror story. And that's a gigantic achievement, is taking this vibrant literary and cultural tradition and updating it to modern times. And because he's the stair step that you go from Frankenstein and Castle of Otranto and Wuthering Heights up into a modern world of, uh, you know, expanding galaxies and deep time and evolutionary disasters and global warming and terrorism and other mass nightmares. Because the Gothic is a very personal nightmare. It's one usually blonde girl in a fallen down abbey or empty castle having a nightmarish experience. Lovecraft is saying humanity is this one blonde girl and the universe is a Gothic castle. And that expression is so powerful and so important and still so true, even more so in the 21st century, because even the certainties of Lovecraft's modernist science are gone, right? Einstein famously couldn't handle quantum mechanics. He spent 20 years trying to figure out a way out of quantum mechanics and couldn't do it. So we are now in a world that is even more chaotic, even less understandable, even less applicable to human interest, uh, a scientific world at least, than Lovecraft thought, and obviously our cultural world is also, uh, you know, it's fissioned off into a million different uh, perspectives. There's whole streams of cultural thought coming into our existence that Lovecraft, A, wouldn't have known about, B, would have hated and feared if he did. So we're in a more Lovecraftian cosmos than even Lovecraft was. So obviously Lovecraft is going to stay more and more relevant. Heinlein, by comparison, is writing about that that era of high modernism, right? That era of certainty, that era of as long as everyone plays by Newton's laws, the, the strongest will survive. And if the strong are decent, God-fearing Americans of all races, creeds, and colors, then we will take them with us. And Heinlein is writing about that future, right? If you look at Heinlein's future history, 
there's not there, there's very little of it that is actually pessimistic. Even the brief fallbacks, you revolt in twenty one hundreds or whatever. That is the story that he's always telling is about the destruction of that of, of that backsliding, the return to progress. Even his most even, you know even so all of his dystopias are created in order to be rebelled against by his heroes. And when he's just doing a straight on heroic story, then he's writing about a heroic confrontation with the outside that is something that is less possible in a world of multiple viewpoints and multiple results and multiple disasters than it was even in, you know, the, the days of World War II and the Depression when Heinlein's, you know, uh, Heinlein's mentality was being formed. Because even then, all you had to worry about was just getting North America straightened out and you could fix everything else, Right. And Heinlein's fiction back and forth has been basically about that concern. And then after the 60s, he starts looking for the parts of North America because he's not an idiot. He sees that society has changed very dramatically since 1940. But he's looking around for those parts that he wants to save. And so when he writes, you know, something like um, uh, uh, you know, Job or, or uh, Friday or some of those, he's trying to explore back into the past and say, how what do we, what do we take out of this? Do we take... Um, West, uh, you know, South Pacific, you know, uh, line marriages. Do we take California nudity? What part of this culture, now that we can uh, smorgasbord, what are we going to build this new certain future with? And of course, Lovecraft's answer is there is no certain future. The certain future is cockroaches and monsters. That's our certain future. And so as long as we still believe largely as a culture that our future is cockroaches and monsters, people who write in that idiom are going to speak more to us than people who say, if there are cockroach monsters, we're going to build awesome battle suits and we're going to go beat them on their own planet. So once we as a culture, and cultures don't stay static, right? I mean, at some point, the pendulum swings back or you draw in enough developments or some global crisis happens that forces a narrowing of, of perspective. Um, and then maybe Heinlein will come back. People come in and out of, uh, you know, literary esteem all the time. Steinbeck is a great example. Uh, in the 30s, he was, like, absolutely top-notch. He was, you know, shortlisted for all kinds of prizes. Then in the 50s and 60s, he was sort of seen as a, you know, oh, well, you can you can get kids to read him because he's, he's good for that. And then in the 80s, he was almost completely forgotten because he was, you know, just another dead white guy who was producing, whining about being a dead white guy books. And everyone's like, well, we don't really need that anymore. And now Steinbeck is beginning to come back up because people have got enough distance on Steinbeck that they can write back and they say, well, this is actually kind of an interesting perspective on the Depression. This is, you know, talking about economic crises and economic concerns that maybe we have again. So Steinbeck is sort of coming back. And I think you see that anyone who is an absolute A-list, anything who isn't Shakespeare or Dickens or Jane Austen, they're all going to go up and down as you go through. I mean, Byron went up and down. Shelley went up and down. It's going to happen to Lovecraft. But Lovecraft started from such a down that even a reaction against Lovecraft is going to leave him higher than he was when I started reading him. So um, Lovecraft has got a long way to go, and I think as cultural studies become more important in the, ac in the academic world, we'll see ever more attention paid to Lovecraft because he is a fundamental uh, contributor to American culture. Right? The reason that we believe in any video game, in any music video, in any anything, if a tentacle comes out, we know it's evil. That's because of H.P. Lovecraft. That isn't anybody else. I mean, H.P. Lovecraft, Dashiell Hammett, and Owen Wister, if you take all of them out, there's no pop culture left, right? There's, there's nothing. So really, you have to... You're starting to scare me now. Yeah, you... <laughs> there's only three guys that everything <laughs> springs from. Pretty much, yeah. I wow. mean, there's other people who might have done it instead. Obviously, Chandler might have done it instead of Hammett, but Hammett did it first, and he set the pattern that even Chandler was reacting to. Owen Wister, same thing with Westerns. Lovecraft, mm -hmm. very much the same thing with horror. And you can prove it, because even now, no one reads William Hope Hodgson. Very few people read Arthur Machen. Lovecraft is the guy who's still speaking to everybody. He's still moving stuff along. So I think that, you know, that's, you know, the, to, to what extent we get a vote in the present, mm -hmm. our votes are being cast for Lovecraft. And I always love to talk to people about this setting because it is, I always have a weakness for basically kitchen sink Wahoo settings, anything and everything with the rule of cool thrown in, and this pretty much sums it up. 
because basically instead of the Enola Grey going to Hiroshima, it ends up in the eye of the snake of Oberus as it's trying to wrap around the earth. It's a very pulpy setting, um, which is about the same time as Love. Well, actually, Lovecraft was a little earlier than Pulp. Well, Lovecraft is writing at the sort of the dawn of the Pulp era. Okay. I mean, he's yeah. his first story is written in 1917. The Pulp era has conventionally begun around 1919. Um, you can get arguments back and forth, but Lovecraft is definitely one of the people that gives the pulps the energy. He wrote for a very bad, a very poor selling pulp for Weird Tales, which had a much bigger cultural uh, impact now than it had in 1930 when Lovecraft was uh, not being paid for it. But he did publish in Astounding, and he did publish in Amazing. Uh, Amazing with Gerns back in Astounding, pre-Campbell. So he was part of the pulp conversation. And Robert E. Howard, who I took as the as the touchstone for Day After Ragnarok, very much part of the pulp world. He Not just weird tales, but spicy stories, oriental tales. He was publishing westerns. He was publishing all manner of uh, pulp stories in all manner of pulp markets and was only expanding them uh, when he you know took his own life in 1936. So Howard is very much a, a core pulp author and again on the theory that you know you, you wash away enough gravel and the gold stays in the pan Howard is one of the ones that we remember but there were tons of other people writing you know, you know cowboys and, and guys stabbing each other and, and all manner of adventure stuff that, that Howard was part so of. So how do these settings inspire you? Well, I mean, the thing with Day After Ragnarok is that was created because I was looking for a concept that would hold a, a suppressed transmission together. I used to do a column for Steve Jackson Games called Suppressed Transmissions, and a, one of the things that I would do in it was I would sometimes build an alternate history, and I thought, let's have a big, louder-than-bombs alternate history, and what's louder than the Midgard Serpent, right? Going around the Earth, destroying everything. Well, what happens if you stop in the middle? What happens if you kill the Midgard Serpent? Well, who kills the Midgard Serpent? Thor kills the Midgard Serpent. Well, let's set it... Let's go back to the old Nazis or up to Nazi magic stuff. The the Anna and Erba and all those guys. So Hitler... Uh, in, in the book, I mentioned that there is an actual quote from a U.S. Army intelligence assessment of Hitler that said, For Hitler, his, his myth requires a god or Dameron. And this is there trying to assess, will he surrender, will he not surrender? But if you just look at that bald statement, what that means is Ragnarok is a Nazi war aim. That they want Ragnarok to happen. So I thought, okay, Hitler does it. The Nazis are schmucks, so they do it wrong. Uh, Truman, in our Thor, in this cosmos, sends the, uh, the strange cargo, which was a different B-29 that was also being trained to carry the bomb. It was in Iceland, and they were going to drop it on Hitler if he didn't surrender in time. But they uh, put the they put the bomb onto the onto the strange cargo. It goes into the Midgard Serpent's eye, blows up, kills the Midgard Serpent in mid summoning. The serpent falls across the earth, smashes Europe. Its head crushes Egypt. A wave of poison venom pours out and rains down on North America to break it up into city states. And the goal with that is because I wanted to create a Hyborian age post World War Two. I wanted it to feel like Conan the Barbarian. And to make it feel like Conan, you have to have a bunch of different city-states. You have to have mercenaries be able to move back and forth. You have to have a, a seller's market in violence. Um, and the way to do that was to destroy all of America, uh, east of the Rockies. So every decision that I made was made, it then fed more decisions in, this, in the course of the book, but it was made in order to make that universe feel like a Robert E. Howard universe. And again, you know, the, the, the Howard is all about the oncoming doom, and that's what that is. The Rag, Ragnarok has happened. What happens after? What's 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 your post-apocalyptic adventure like? And then that's that's where all of that other stuff sprang out of was once you've once you've taken that first hit, and that first hit was just taken from that line from that assessment of Hitler and from the notion that I wanted to write something bigger than people see a lot. You know, it's not a it's not an a, a Nazis won World War II. It's not a, uh, a Patton and the Russians get to it World War II. It's, World War II is literally Ragnarok. It's the end times. Now what? And that was the that was sort of the impetus for, for that book. You know, and just kind of a personal note of mine, that was the actual historical name of that craft in Iceland, right? Yeah, right. You couldn't have asked for a better name to set up in your... And even better, the captain cargo. of that craft was actually named Captain Westover. 
<laughs> that was his name, was Captain Westover. And it's like, I'm not making this up anymore. I've actually opened a door onto another universe, and in there... Very Tim Powers esque. That, that, yeah, very much. Very, very Tim Powers detail. That happens to me whenever I write these things. Is that there's a point at which you are no longer making things up. You're merely researching the truth, and <laughs> you have to transcribe it accurately. And I like things like pulp because there's just so much imagination, and there's some optimism, and there's boundless creativity at the stuff that they do and they come up with. But the pulp era had a lot of issues compared to how our culture is now. I mean, you know, it was very institutionalized at that point, the concepts of the, the racism and, you know, Western civilization. How do you tackle that so you can bring the pulpy goodness and then try again to sift that gold up and get all that crud out? Well, I mean, part of the thing is just be aware of the sources that you're using. Um, Robert E. Howard absolutely has a lot of racist elements in his writing. Uh, even more so than Lovecraft. Lovecraft may have been a worse racist in his personal life, but he kept majority out of his published writing. Certainly there's other stuff that he published as an amateur or that is in his letters that's really foul, but you're not required to go back to that stuff if you're just doing a game based on Call of Cthulhu or uh, Shadow Out of Time or, or the vast majority of Lovecraft's material can be read in any number of different ways because it's great literature. Howard's stuff may or may not be great literature, but much more of it is about racial essentialism and cultural essentialism. And much more of his discussion of race issues comes from a fact that he was from central Texas in 1930. Lovecraft was from Rhode Island in 1930. And Lovecraft, you know, no one will be, you know, appointing him NAACP Man of the Year, <laughs> but Howard was worse. And interestingly, Howard was a political liberal in Texas. So for his neighborhood, he was, you know, more broad-minded and, you know, open to stuff than the people he knew. But the, like you say, that culture was so deeply institutionalized, there's only so many people can climb out of that. Jack London is like the only author of the period who I think actually transcends race in his writing. And Jack London, again, is problematic for a lot of other reasons, but it's not that. So... What you do is you just have to be aware of the sources. And if you're going to go and you're going to take something like uh, Black Canaan or, uh, or, or um, uh, Pigeons from Hell or whatever, and you're going to use that as your source material, you have to make sure that the thing that you're using is the part that speaks to everybody, not just to nervous white guys. And sometimes you can do it easier than other times. Um, with Howard, a lot of it becomes easier if, uh, for, for example, in... Um, uh, Across the Black River, which is one of the uh, things that I, I use in uh, Day After Ragnar in the setting, there is a, a, a Pictish uh, uh, bad guy who is very clearly an American Indian. And so in the version of that that I'm doing uh, for, the, uh, um, uh, for the material, that guy is going to be a... Uh, he's not going to be an American Indian. He's going to be a guy who's gone off into the swamps mm -hmm. and believes that he's an American Indian, right? Mm -hmm. So you can you can take some of that. Others things just can't be done very easily. There's a Robert E. Howard ripoff of Fu Manchu called um, uh, a Cathulos uh, Skullface. And Skullface is the name of the novel. Cathulos is the guy. Um, Cathulos is at least an Atlantean. He's not a Chinaman, so we're we're a step in the right direction. But I put the the Siafan into uh, Bookhounds of London because of what you said, the energy and the, and the excitement. And I made it uh, Howard's skull face that's in charge of the Siafan. And I mentioned that because his character is from Atlantis, he knows that the white race is born of cannibal white apes, like in Lovecraft's story, Arthur German. And that's why he hates white people, because he knows that we're ape men. And that's still racially charged, but it's racially charged in a different way. I mean, at least you now have a assumption on his part that we're savages, which is something that doesn't appear in Romer and it doesn't appear in, in Howard. So you can, you can detour it, you can um, drain it out, or you can just ignore it, which is the other way to do it. And, you know, one Zeppelin adventure is much like another Zeppelin adventure. And if the guy in charge of the Zeppelin, you just make sure that he's not always the same blue-eyed crew cut blonde white guy and sometimes he's a Sikh Indian or maybe he's a South Chinese uh, genius and Jess Nevins has gone and done a huge book for fate um, uh, called um, I think it's Strange Tales of the Century mm -hmm. that goes and finds all of your non-white 
non-male uh, pulp uh, protagonists. So if you're looking for one, you can find one and put him in as one of your sort of uh, star characters. And um, I, I do that whenever I can. I, you know, basically, I just go to a Justin Evans uh, book and I just dig into it and I find someone who I can then promote to be a, a main hero. So there's a um, in a Tehran Nest of Spies that we did for uh, after Ragnarok. There's one Persian detective uh, hero, mm -hmm. and I just make him a central character. So now you've got a, a local instead of an American or a Brit who's your your fundamental central hero. So, you know, you can do what you can, and if you're doing anything that's a, a that's a modern story or set any time in the future, then it's incumbent on you not to just reflexively reflect the world of 1920 or the world of 1930. What you're trying to reflect is the energy and the optimism and the can-do attitude and the technophilia, maybe, or the guerrillophilia. You're not trying to reflect um, uh, institutionalized sexism and racism. And, or if you are, then go ahead, but people will notice. <laughs> Unfortunately, we've got to wrap up. Um, and we could probably spend another hour talking because I, I want to give you a moment to basically talk about real quick, let people be aware of your latest project, which is another creative mashup. Yeah, the, the, the latest thing is Dracula Dossier, which is uh, a campaign for my game Knights Black Agents. The short version of Knights Black Agents is Jason Bourne if the Treadstone conspiracy was vampires. So you look at the Bourne trilogy, his job of killing them, or taken if the guys who took Liam Neeson's daughter were vampires. That's what that game is. This game, uh, this campaign, the Dracula dossier, is uh, Dracula was the after-action report of an actual British intelligence attempt to recruit a vampire in 1894. It went wrong. Uh, MI6 has been trying to bring Dracula back into the fold for 125 years. They didn't learn the first time? They did not learn the first time. In 1940, <laughs> they tried to get him to... Um, uh, uh, take uh, Romania out of the Hitler, uh, Romania out of the Axis. That doesn't work very well. But now they've got Dracula hunting Al Qaeda across Europe, or so they think. Your job is to follow the clues, hunt down Dracula, kill him, get it right, and get it done. So again, thank you guys for uh, dropping by, checking us out. We shot this whole thing right here with this whole awesome list of venerated books: the Player's Guide, Tunnels and Trolls, and Champions over here at our uh, official headquarters stop and sponsor, the Adventure Game Store in South Florida in Davie. And uh, check out our podcast at nerdtravaganza.com. Thanks. Take care, guys.